So welcome back to the Recruiter of Oz podcast. Woo! My name, Scott Smith. I'm with Mark Tortorisi, who is a professional sourcer or recruiter, depending on the day and the job. So, Mark, how's it going? Uh, it's going okay. It's going okay. It's, uh, you know, sunny over here in sunny California. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, th- things, are, things are good. <laughs> Excellent. Well, hey, so today for our next episode, I wanted to kind of focus on working with sourcers and recruiters. And, and you know, these are some of the things that that candidates will have to deal with because they're just kind of a, a, a a necessary gatekeeper to the hiring manager. So basically we want to take a look at some of the, you, you almost said it's necessary evil. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you keep you know, call a spade a spade, it's a necessary evil. Uh, so yeah, I mean, Mark, basically I want to do, have this conversation because with you, especially because of your experience as that sorcerer and you have some perspectives that may be useful for the people listening to this. So when 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 you're starting a job search and and you start submitting resumes what do you kind of do what's your process yeah i mean there's there's i will say this there are plenty of bad recruiters out there like plenty like plenty of bad recruiters out there and names I, names addresses there's there's too many phone numbers. There's, there's too many to name now there are some very good ones too and the ones that are good at their craft, you can usually tell they end up showing the kind of like um, one-on-one kind of attention to detail. They kind of like set expectations and they follow them. Those are like your 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 good recruiters, the ones that always get back to you no matter what, even if it's right. like not good news or even if it's like no news, like those are the good recruiters. That being said, there are plenty of bad recruiters that are out there and they could be bad for a number of different reasons. It could be being overworked, which maybe a fault of theirs but could not be a fault of their own Mm -hmm. they could just be not good at following up that's a fault of their own so it it just depends so i would say that when you're working with a recruiter it's you know you know keep in mind you don't you don't know exactly what you're getting yeah (laughs) it's like you know that whole box of chocolates thing so yeah, I, I get it. I mean, there, there's been a mixed bag for me as well. I think I've talked with probably about 20 recruiters over the past four months, and each one of them, you know, is interesting. Um, a lot of them are really good. A lot of them bring a lot to the table and, and have a lot of good information to impart to me as a candidate and other candidates about the, the hiring managers. But um, I, I, I guess when when you enter into that recruiter relationship, you, you want to kind of get yourself in the right headspace with with you know how to proceed with that so when when you're looking at that initial call things went well right and and you want to move forward to that next position or not next position but that next step in the process what do you do yeah so it's a good idea and the recruiter should be doing this anyways uh when i say set expectations i mean the recruiter should be like setting up timelines establishing what's going to happen next right even if they do that, you as the candidate should always state the same thing. You should always say, great, I'm going to follow up with you on X, Y, Z date. If I don't hear anything from you, I'll follow up on this date. Like you establish like that, those timelines as well. So that does a couple of things. It lets the, the candidate know that you're serious about the job. Okay. It lets them know that you're going to follow through like anything that you promise. And it lets them know that you're just not going to like, kind of just sit around and then let them make a decision like on, on a whim and hope that you'll still be around because if a, right. a candidate, a, most candidates, if, especially if they're good, are not going to hang around forever and they shouldn't, right. right? Candidates should not put all their eggs in one basket. They should have multiple jobs that they're looking at. Sure. So the recruiter should set those expectations, but the candidate should also set expectations and say, Hey, I'm going to call you up. I'm going to follow up with you. I'm going to email you, whatever that is at this time. And then, you know, to find out what's going to happen. Okay. So that's, that's good advice. And I'm, I'm hearing a number of things that I've already screwed up on through this job search. <laughs> and, and, and really it's being more proactive in setting expectations with that sourcer as far as when I'm going to follow up. And, and, and I think what that also does, you know, if you're doing that as a, a candidate, you're, you're making it 
known that this is going to happen and you're not going to therefore sound like a total uh, pain in the butt by following up repeatedly with these, these sorcerers. Exactly. Um, and, and so that's where I've kind of dropped the ball. I didn't realize, or I didn't think about, you know, how do I move this question along? How do I move this, this, this process along from my end? And, and so that's kind of what I need right. to kind of reevaluate and, and, and do going forward. That's, that's great. Um, that's great advice, Mark. And I think that we should step back a little bit. So we've already got that, that, you know, what's next once you've already talked to the recruiter, but say we're going into our initial screening with a recruiter or sourcer and, and you want to make sure that, that that's a useful conversation for both sides in order to gauge kind of what the expectations are from the hiring organization and also what your expectations are for a company that you are evaluating joining. Talk about some of the questions that you want to have queued up for a recruiter in, in this type of situation. Yeah. So there's some good ones that you can ask um, when you're talking to a recruiter, definitely ask them questions about like the role, like why is this role open? Um, what does like success look like for this particular role? When you hire somebody who's like really good, what is uh, a successful hire look like? Right. Those are important questions. Another question to ask is kind of like more of like a, a bottom line um, question. What happens if this role is open for the next six months? What's that going to do to the, either the org or the company's bottom line? That can mm -hmm. also give you a sense of how important it is, how what, what it's actually impacting. And so it's just different ways of kind of asking the same question, but it's good to know. And it also shows that you are interested in like the business aspects of the role and its impact within the company rather than just like the job itself. Now, side note on that, that's, that's a great bit of advice there because usually I'm, I'm going for the lowest common denominator with recruiters because I've been doing so many of them. And my question is basically, so how quickly are you looking to fill this position? And that, right. that will give me a little bit of information, but, but with the example <laughs> that you just provided, it, it makes it, it, it 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 adds a little bit more to that ask, and I think that it 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 places a little bit more interest on on behalf of the candidate. And you know, I, I think that I'm going to try that next time. Yeah, I mean, when you ask them, like, I mean, everyone always asks that, like, how soon are you looking to hire this role? I mean, like, they're like, yeah, right away. I mean, they might as well say like within the next five years, but we're starting now, right? I mean, it's like yeah. neither one makes a difference. Like, the role is open, so just. Let's get it done. <laughs> so basically, that's a throwaway question for me, and uh, I will go ahead and actually add some meat to it. That's good. So now, if you if you yeah. do want to now if you do want to get down to the nitty gritty of timelines in terms of hires, I mm -hmm. would ask, hey, are you talking to any candidates like in final stage? Are you talking to candidates uh, who've already done on sites? That will be more telling because if they've made it to the yeah. on site interview. And even when I say on site, that could, it could still be virtual. Yeah. But on site, right. on site basically means with the hiring manager, with yeah. members of the interviewing team, usually like, you know, a panel of like five, six people. That's like an on site. So if they've gotten to that point or even gotten past that point, that's pretty far in the process. So you yeah, want to ask that okay. question. Now, the recruiter, from a compliance perspective, can't tell you exactly like, who the people are and like why you know this this and that but they can tell you yeah we we've got some people that have reached that point right and then right. that gives you an idea of like where you will stand so you in other words you would have to be like really able to knock their socks off as a candidate better than the ones that are already at the end of the process and therein lies the challenge but yeah okay so that's an interesting bit of advice well i'm glad we're having this conversation because you know, it, it it seems to me that this has become kind of a what's good for the goose is good for the gander thing. And and so when a recruiter asks me, are you far, how far are you along me with other um, interview processes? And they always ask that for the most part. Oh, yeah. It's because they're it's the, it's pounded into their brains from like day one that you have to do that. Yeah. And, you yeah. Sh and they should. They should. The, a good recruiter will ask you. Who else are you talking to? Okay, you're talking to three three other companies. How mm -hmm. far along are you? Well, one of them I just applied to. One of them I did a screen with the recruiter, but then I haven't heard anything. Yeah. And then the third one, uh, I did a phone call with the hiring manager. So that lets okay. the recruiter know how much time they have to make a decision on their end if they wanted to do something with you or if they wanted to kind of keep you in the process for a certain amount of time. 
Interesting. So that, that translates and extrapolates out for me <laughs> to, I asked the same question of the recruiter and, and exactly. And so that's interesting. Cool. Um, shoot. I had something on the tip of my tongue that I was going to kind of parlay into, but I guess that, uh, that's not, <laughs> that's not going to happen. Um, now let's take a look at different recruiters, right? At the beginning of the the chat, you had mentioned that there are bad recruiters. So we know this. I mean, I think yes. we've all experienced what we would call a bad recruiter. But let's let's dig a little bit into what a good good source or a good recruiter looks like. Yeah. So a good source and recruiter, a couple of different changes. For one, it's just the the follow up, right? Setting expectations right. and following up. Like that's like that's like a hard thing for people to get down for some reason, but. Following up when you're going to and saying, you know, basically being as good as your word, like that's like a good recruiter. Right. Now, a great recruiter is somebody who sticks with that even when they have nothing new to tell you. And that can be frustrating on the candidate side for someone to call you up and say like, yeah, no change. Right. But still, it'd be good to hear that rather than hear nothing, because then you get into the whole thing of like the the. ATS black hole or like yes. I was ghosted by a recruiter and lived to tell about it or you know whatever it is. Right. So right. it's a great recruiter will follow up even when there is no new information. And there are a multitude of reasons why there is no new information. Mm-hmm. And I would say probably yeah, 99% of them are completely out of their control. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think it's worth expanding a little bit on on the candidate perspective around this too, because when you have a recruiter, a bad recruiter in this case, that doesn't respond, doesn't, you know, it's just basically radio silent, even though the wheels might be turning on that side. A candidate can sour very quickly because as as most of us know, you know, if you've been unemployed, it's very stressful. Yeah. And, and, and you're trying to figure out, okay, so how am I going to sub, 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 sustain myself here? I mean, I don't have any money coming in. I have to pay bills. And these people don't understand how important this is. Well, it may be important to you, but it's not as important to them necessarily. They're they're looking at a whole other set of criteria when, when looking at candidates. But at the same time, if a candidate sours on a role, regardless of whether that recruiter might be looking to advance them to the next steps, that 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 doesn't do anybody any good because then a candidate will, you know, often step out of a position because they're pissed off about that lack of contact. And, and lack of visibility into the process. So, yeah, I mean, while it might be stressful to not have any real direction or information about what's next, if a recruiter gets back to me and says, hey, I just wanted to touch base with you, nothing's happening yet, but I'm keeping you posted, that makes me feel a hell of a lot better than than not hearing anything. So um, I agree with you, but I also think that it is definitely a boon to have a recruiter it, it like is. that. Yeah, and... Uh, a good recruiter, I think, will always outline like the next steps. And the, depending on the company that you're at, sometimes it's the recruiter and the recruiting coordinator that are working kind of in tandem. And you may get communications from one or both of them. But okay. they'll set up, hey, you're going to be meeting with these people, these next steps. Here are their names. Look them up on LinkedIn. Like, look at what they do. Mm-hmm. You know, they'll they'll set you up for success. So a good recruiter will set you up for success because, again, if you are a candidate that they want to hire, mm-hmm. and if you're getting to like, you know, a hiring manager interview or even an onsite, they're going to try and do as much as they can to make you successful. Like they're going to try yeah. and prep, they're going to try and prep you for like, you know, the interview, they're going to give you like pointers as to right. what the hiring managers are looking for. So that's what a, a good recruiter will do for sure. And actually, I would call that an exceptional recruiter because that's the that's definitely exception, not the rule. Basically, I think 10% of the recruiters that I have gotten that far with um, have offered that kind of information. And I think that one of my best experiences, I worked for Citrix a while ago, you know, maybe started in 2016. And it was a long process, but the recruiter was constantly feeding me information. Okay, so you're going to meet with this person. This person is the title um, in this department. And they are this kind of personality. So if you're going to speak with them, you want to deliver your your messages in this type of format. And and here are the, some of the key points that they're going to fixate into. And here are some of their interests outside of work. And I, I swear to God, that's what helped me get that role because basically a three-month process, 15 different interviews, 
I knew every one of those interviewers almost as well as, you know, they knew themselves, it seemed like once I got to those, those calls and, and I was able to have a more candid conversation, but a more relaxed conversation as well, because I felt like, okay, I've got this information and I, I, I know what, you know, I can use to kind of further a conversation if, if we stall out. So yeah, that's an exceptional recruiter to me because there's, there's a lot of good recruiters and, but they do their jobs. But yeah. when you start adding stuff like that, that's a huge value add. Yeah, they're like, uh, this hiring manager, they like really rude, crass jokes. So yeah, just, you know, make sure you do that when you talk with them. I've had that before. <laughs> yeah, this person doesn't really read rooms well. So maybe, <laughs> you know, when they start talking about pink slippable things, you might want to just kind of brush it off. And we'll take care of that afterward. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we'll take care of that on the uh, the HR side. And and funny enough, I've actually had that where they they had an interviewer that was really kind of crass, and uh, I was fine with it because I can pull crass as well. If you want to play that with me, I'm good. <laughs> I, I'm I'm a chameleon because I'm in communications. But at the same time, that didn't fly with the internal team, and he was let go apparently before Ooh. I started. I'm like, wow. Um, but yeah. So, all right. Now, and all right. I think- that that basically sums up, you know, what a, what a good recruiter is, and some of the elements that you're going to benefit from with a good recruiter. Now you'd mentioned the bad recruiters, and I've already said that twice, but let's dig a little bit deeper into kind of bad sourcer slash yeah. recruiters, and and you know, talk about yes. that. So so a couple of things. So we'll start with the sourcing piece. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of bad sourcers, and when I say bad sourcers, I mean or, or recruiters, if they do their own sourcing, uh, the ones who will basically message everybody who's got like the one buzzword on their profile. Oh, yeah. So somewhere I, I've, I've done like trainings for like companies that are doing like, you know, cybersecurity and stuff like that. And I think mm-hmm. I mentioned that somewhere on my profile. And I've also done system administration for like Windows servers before too, which is somewhere I think I'm on my profile still. But because yeah. of those things, I will still occasionally get reached out to by recruiters for security roles or yep. like systems administration roles. And I'm like, did you read my resume? I mean, obviously they, they did not. So right. bad sources will do that where they just message everybody who's got like the one buzzword without looking at what they do. And okay. so- Okay, yes, you're right. It, yeah. Really quickly hold that thought. And I, I had to certify for basically an, an uh, artificial intelligence platform from my last employer. And right. and I had to do that because I, I'm a communications person talking with technical analysts about it. But ever since then, people are saying, do you want to uh, apply for this role as a data scientist and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'm like, oh, yeah, no, no, thanks. But but you know Data IQ. I said, yeah, whoops, I didn't mean to mention the name, but great company, <laughs> enjoyed working for them very much. But but basically, but you know this platform. So why don't you come in and interview with us at least? And I'm thinking... Did you not read my LinkedIn profile? Because <laughs> nowhere on there it says I, I was computer science or data science or anything like that. Um, and and so, yeah, I, I, I've experienced that more often than not, funny enough. I think I've received 25 pinks since I got that certification last year. Oh, man. It, yeah. You don't want me as a data scientist, people. <laughs> Yes, can you write, we're going to need you to write up some uh, a Python uh, a Python a piece of Python software to uh, move data from this pipeline to this data lake, and then we're going to use a little bit of uh, some you know Java to you know pull out the data, and then we're going to like analyze it with uh, some sort of business intelligence software that you created, right. right. And you know the thing, the funny thing about that comment you just made is I could do the first part of it. I could write that Python script to move it into a data lake. But other than that, no, I, I, I not even touching any of it. But I digress. Back to bad. bad yeah. So, so that's like that's like bad sourcing. Now, once they once you get a hold of them, a bad source or a recruiter, uh, when they screen you on the phone, if they're doing a bad job, that means they're doing most of the talking and they shouldn't be doing most of the talking. You should be doing most of the talking. In other words, they should have the right questions to ask you about your experience so that you can tell them and they can take their notes. If they're doing all the talking, then it's not right. The the ratio should be something like 80-20 in terms of what you're talking versus their talking. So that's interesting too, because I've had a number of those sourcers who are are just talk, 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 talk. And like I mentioned in, I think the first episode, 
um, you know, they, they talk the whole time. And then the last two minutes, they ask you a little bit about yourself. But what I read into with that is basically, I've got something to hide about this role. I've got something to hide about the company, the manager, or whatever it is. And I don't want to open up the floor to those types of questions that could possibly happen. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it, it could be that. But I, th- I think it's just less nefarious. I think it's just just being lazy and going kind of going on autopilot. Like they, your your candidate number six, they have to talk to that day, and they're just they're just trying to hash it out and get through it all. That's all. And so it's like eventually okay. when you when you when you get into routines, we as humans, when we get into routines, we become lazy. Yes, we do. <laughs> so that's that's what all that is. Okay. Um, a good recruiter and a good sourcer will ask questions about your background as it relates to the job so that you can tell them why you're a good fit for it. You you can tell them why your accomplishments can translate to um, success at the company. Um, That's what a good source and recruiter should do when they're talking to you. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Now a bad source and recruiter, they will do a screen with you and then they'll never email you again, or they email you maybe like, a month later and you're like what happened you're like i was ghosted yeah. then you go on linkedin you post i was ghosted and then you know yeah you, you do your thing but they should be able to follow up with you they should follow up with you within like a, a pretty quick time after a uh, a screen after yeah. a hiring manager screen they should definitely follow up with you within you know within the the day or the next day and if i have they, not been that lucky yeah. And then if you do an on-site interview, yeah. they should be following up with you, not necessarily with the decision, but they should be following up with you saying like, Hey, I thought that went great. Here yeah. are the things that they liked. Like they should be outlining all that stuff. Now it doesn't mean that right. they, you, you need to get a decision right afterwards, because uh, I think we're going to talk about this in a second. There are many things that are keeping them from coming to a conclusion right away. Right. Right. It makes sense. I mean, but Honestly, I've been lucky. I mean, there when when something really goes well and when there's that dialogue, I, I I've had a number of times where the recruiter will immediately say, "Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna have you talk to the hiring manager. I'm gonna have you talk to this person, and this person, because I think that that there's a really good synergy here." And I, I enjoy those conversations, obviously, because those they're exciting. You know, and it sounds like you're actually being heard. But but when we go to a, like a bad source, or and I, I'm kind of kind of go back to what you were just saying, um, yeah, when they do all the talking what are they going to follow up with you about? Because they didn't have enough time to screen you. I mean, you're supposed to be screened and they're supposed to get an idea of who you are personally and, 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 and what your, what your personality is like, what your communications are, you know, ability is your quirks, whatever the case may be. But if there's nothing there and they spoke the whole time, they don't have anything to bring back to the hiring manager, which kind of begs the question in my mind, how do you ever get people hired? Yeah, exactly. So if they're, goal is to just kind of like talk to you and make sure that you like have a, a heartbeat like have a pulse <laughs> right. and then they're going to send you to the hiring manager okay well then like what purpose are they serving right like they, there should be some level of assessment on their side before they send you over to the hiring manager otherwise every candidate they talk to is like going to get sent over to the hiring manager so there yeah, should yeah. be there, there should be that kind of like a way for them to discern which ones are going to be a better fit for for the role yeah yeah no makes sense okay yeah so so yeah so i mean and then i think you you talked about uh candidates about not you know candidates that are basically like kind of like not getting an answer from the source or recruiter and like what do they do like right has that ever happened to you has it ever happened to me (laughs) you mean this week (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah Yeah, you know, it it happens quite a bit. It's it's interesting because I, I, I think I'd mentioned this in the first episode. We had um, I, I was referred by a chief product officer for a company, and it was really just it's a cool company, and it's something that I was really excited about because I'd worked with this guy before. He referred me to the hiring manager directly, who would then respond and said, "Hey, yeah, we want to get you into, you know, on into the rotation for a call." And he included the the sorcerer, the internal sorcerer, and said, hey, can you go ahead and set this up? Well, I said, thanks so much. Looking forward to it. And sorcerer, name, insert here. Pleasure to meet you, albeit virtually. Here's when I'm available. And I didn't hear from that person for over a week and a half until I followed up with the hiring manager and said, hey, 
haven't heard back yet. Just wanted to follow up, make sure this is still kind of on the, you know, on the books as, as an open role. And he got back and he said, well, yeah, it is. And why don't we just go ahead and, you know, set this meeting up between you and you and me right now. And then it was funny that the recruiter, all of a sudden, I, I get five emails from that person. I'm just like, oh. <laughs> yep. But that, yeah, so that happens. That happens. It does. But you know what? It allowed me time to sit there and stress about it and think, well, you would think that there's a little bit more weight if one of your your chief level, you know, your C-level people have referred you as someone they've worked with in the past in that summer in that similar role. But I was I was really frustrated. I'm going, well, this is awkward. And and you know, how many times can I follow up? And I I ultimately had that that whole fight through the process. It was like trying to get responses from that recruiter, even with the added, you know, push of, okay, this is a hiring manager referral, which was a, a, a chief, uh, a chief level pre- referral. And um, I, I ultimately got the offer, but unfortunately, I mean, and I did accept it by the way, but it was verbal. So a week later they said, well, okay, we, we are now having challenges because of the, 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 the banking problems and, and oh, CEO wants to man. kind of eliminate all hiring with the exception of sales. And like, okay, I get that, but it was, it would have been so cool, but I, I did have some questions about, okay, so how is the role going to be if this is how the hiring process goes? Yeah. So a couple of things on that. Yeah. Some companies, so I've worked at some companies, there were bigger companies where they actually have like SLAs, in place for the sources of recruiters to get okay. back to applicants to get back to referrals. Like if they okay. don't do it, if they don't do it within like 24, 48 hours, like they get dinged in their in their performance score. Okay. So there now, are about 15 dings. Well, but not every company does that. Ah, okay. And and also if they're using like, I mean, there's so many different ATS systems, there's so many different like performance management type like employee, you know, like uh, employee employee systems, HR yeah, systems. Yeah. Do, does that exist? Who knows, right? So not every company does that. Okay. So it's it can make it difficult then when you kind of get these referrals, especially mm-hmm. for companies that are maybe like a little newer or less people and things aren't really ironed out as much as like a, a larger kind of behemoth like corporation. Right. It can be difficult because some stuff can fall through the cracks. And you get these recruiters that are like, they're working 50 roles and they're like talking to like, you know, 30 different hiring managers. And they're like, yeah, which one, what am I doing? And they're, you know, it's, yeah, they're, they're overworked. And so I I can't even imagine. So, yeah, but I will extend that, that, um, well, I get it. Let's put it that way. (laughs) It's still, it's still there. There's that disconnect between candidate and sourcer and it it creates sometimes just bad. Well, should we talk? Well, should we talk about why why can't why uh, the recruiters or sorcerers don't call you back? We talk um, about I that? think that would be a great uh, segue. Yes, let's do it. So, a couple of reasons. So, you're applying for a role, or you've talked to the recruiter and you've done a screen with them, or you've even talked to the hiring manager and done a screen with them, and then silence. Yes, it's like it's like the wasteland with the crickets in the background. Tumbleweeds. So why is that happening? A couple of things. Like I said before, 99% of the time, it's not the recruiter's fault. Sometimes it is, and that's just bad recruiter. But 99% of the time, nothing to do with what they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's a couple of other things. Some of them could be related to the hiring process. Some of them are related to the budget for the organization mm-hmm. or the the budget for the company as a whole. Like, I mean, all these different things factor into it. Right. But a couple of reasons why. Um, one of them, the hiring manager is on vacation. They said to the recruiter, hey, go out and find me a bunch of these candidates. I'll talk to them when I get back. Mm-hmm. So the recruiter talks to you, says, yeah, you're great. We should give you a call with the hiring manager. Great. And then they forget. or they just think, well, we'll just let that guy kind of sit there. And then two weeks go by and you're like, WTF, man. Yeah, right. right. And so what you don't know on the other end is that the hiring manager went on leave for like three weeks to kind of like go relax in like sunny Aruba or something like that. So you're on the other end waiting for like that call and 
the hiring manager is not even there. So nothing can actually happen. Now, yeah. bad, bad recruiter version will not tell you that that's happening. So right. it's a good recruiter will say that and say, hey, the hiring manager is going to be back at this time. Mm-hmm. Okay. If that's the case, well, then why were you talking to me like three weeks ago? <laughs> right. Exactly. So that could be one thing. Now, here's another thing that could happen while you don't get a call back. The recruiter decided to go on vacation for two weeks. Yep. Which that's fine. Everyone deserves a vacation, like mm-hmm. maybe once or twice in their life. But the recruiter didn't get anyone to cover their candidates or their recs. So now everything is just sitting there. And the recruiter's like, oh, yeah, I'll just check when I'm like, you know, sitting in like, you know, the spa you mm-hmm. know, in Aruba or whatever. When I'm sitting in the infinity pool in Aruba and I'll follow up with them, except they don't. They're right. they're in the middle of like their um, you know, fourth or fifth, like, you know, tequila headbanger drink for the day, and they've forgotten everything. So you're thinking, what's happening here? Why is nobody getting back to me? And you're like kind of getting angry, and then you start sending messages. And then that's why when all of a sudden like a recruiter gets back from like two weeks of vacation. Yeah, there's an avalanche of emails and they have to do a flurry of like responses. So yes. that could be another reason. So that's on the recruiter to kind of follow up with you and make sure that doesn't happen. A good that's recruiter enough. will set that up and make sure mm-hmm. that that doesn't happen. Another reason why you may not get a call back is because the recruiter was actually fired from their job. Which I've actually experienced as well. Yes, that's uh, that's awkward. Yeah. So that happens. If that happens, it takes like some time for somebody to take that work and hand it over to somebody else who can actually work it. Right. And right. And, and, and if that does happen, there is no email that will go out to you letting you know that. There's Sorry, your, your recruiter contact was fired for exposing themselves <laughs> in the break room. In the yes. break room. Exactly. <laughs> so those are some reasons. Now, another reason, which is actually more of the company and or recruiter and or hiring manager's fault, is the way that they're handling the process. Now, normally a good sourcer and recruiter, when they start working a role with the hiring manager, mm-hmm. they're going to establish what their perfect candidate is. And then they're going to establish like what they're like, kind of like they have, they have their A player, their perfect candidate. Then they're going to establish some like B level and C level candidates. Right. If for some reason our A candidates are all like 50 K a year over budget, well, then we're going to have to get one of these B players. So a good source and recruiter will establish those rules of engagement beforehand. A bad source and recruiter will just listen to what the hiring manager wants and wants the perfect candidate and then just go off and try and find it. They don't give themselves an out with all these other possibilities. And so what happens is they may talk to a candidate and the candidate has everything except for like this one thing. And the hiring manager looks and says, yeah, I like them. They're missing this one kind of background here. How about we just keep them warm and keep looking? Yeah. So they say that. And then instantly the recruiter may not say anything to you, or maybe they just kind of, you know, fall off the face of the earth, like whatever that is, Mm -hmm. that happens a lot. Now, a good recruiter will follow up with you and say, hey, we're still like, you know, trying to decide on like the candidates that are available to you, but right. they shouldn't get to that point. Like, in other words, the recruiter should have, the recruiter or the sourcer should have done the work and said, hey, this A player that you want, I just mm-hmm. did a market map of all of the people that are in the business that do this. And they all come with this years of experience and this salary range. We can mm-hmm. only pay this. So basically you're asking for this. We can only right. pay this chances of us getting this are very low. And so once you give that data to the hiring managers and the team, then they can say, okay, well then what are we going to do? And that's when you say, well, how about if we get this type of candidate? And then they start pitching different levels or versions of that candidate and showing them what they could get for that money. And so they'll set them up for success better that way, rather than just saying, tell me your perfect profile. Great. I'm going to go find it because they've given themselves no choice in the matter after that. That's interesting. I mean, I've had some interesting situations like that in the past three months. And there was one role that was, it was based in Texas, or not based in Texas, but the company was headquartered there. So they were looking at the Texas compensation rates. I mean, it was it was obviously a little bit off from California. And and (laughs) I kept getting calls from this recruiter saying, this is, or sorry, emails. And this is, you know, a great role for you. We had our screening already. And she said, you're, you're a great candidate. I want you to talk with the the hiring manager. 
I did that that hiring manager was great really liked her and uh it was it seemed really cool but then the next conversation was with that sourcer or recruiter I don't remember what she was but she 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 basically told me okay so what salary range are you looking at I said why don't you tell me what salary range is for the role because now I have that power and they have to kind of yeah. you know the power of Christ compels you you will tell me <laughs> um <laughs> And and so she told me, so well, we're gonna max out at this amount. And it was basically fifty thousand under what I was my my market standard was. And I said, Well, okay. <laughs> so here's where I'm at now. And and I'm trying to get a little closer to that, at least because this position is is a lot more involved than my last role. It it, it requires a lot more. And ideally, I'd be about probably five percent above that. And she said, well, we can't do that. I said, okay, well, let's talk about the rest of the comp package then, because I think that, you know, it sounds like a really good role. What, what can you tell me about equity? What can you tell me about uh, perks or anything like that? Sign on bonus. And she said, well, we don't offer equity to anybody under senior vice president level. I said, you know, so, is- but we have, co- we have good coffee. Well, basically. <laughs> and, 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 and she told me, she said, well, what you're really getting is a really great work environment. And I, and yeah, okay. So Glassdoor bore that, even though it's Glassdoor, um, it was, it was up in the 90 percentile. And I guess that, you know, that, that could be artificially bolstered, but it doesn't matter. Yes. The fact that I work remotely says that I couldn't care less about your in-office dynamic. So, okay, cool. That that's your cell to bring me in. So, well, we have, we also have flexible PTO. I said, okay. And you and I both know that flexible PTO is a scam that works on, on, you know, to the advantage of the company that's hiring because they don't have to pay out vacation time at the end. Um, So, well, you're not impressed by that. I said, no, no, I'm not. What is the draw? If you're pulling in a senior director position, a candidate, if you're not paying the salary, if you're not offering equity, if you're not offering perks other than the great work environment, and you're not offering anything else, any concessions, why should I come and work for you? What about and, a box of Krispy Kreme donuts? Okay, week? that might have that might have swayed me the other way, man. <laughs> Are they warm? But uh, that's the problem. So you know, there's there's a lot of that I'm seeing, and, and companies are out there, and they they may be based in other states, and and with this whole remote work, that's changed things as well because. All of a sudden, and I'm going on a tangent. I know it. I know it. But it's it's. I'm, I'm thinking Krispy Kreme donuts now, and I, I I'm, I'm just I'm there. <laughs> but but every state, no matter what company or where the company is located, they have to be aware of the different comp plans for they each do. state. And 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 when they come to a California candidate and say, "Well, we can't pay you that much," well, then okay, you can't be competitive in this market because this is what the 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 market average is. Yeah. So. Anyway, and I know that we're talking about sourcers and recruiters, but you know, it's just it's conversations I had with them. But you know, she she was a good recruiter for the most part, but but the whole thing telling the candidate me that no, we don't we don't really have anything to pull you in. There's nothing compelling. We can't meet your salary. <laughs> Yo, why am I talking to you? Right. And even with the bonus that we're, we're the, the VC, what is it? The VCIP bonus, you, um, you won't make what you were making before. Oh, okay. All right. Well, thanks. I'm going to have to go <laughs> ahead and say no, but uh, I do appreciate it. And I'm, I'm happy that you have a great work environment. <laughs> Y'all, I'm on my way to Krispy Kreme now. <laughs> I, I, I may be doing that after we get off this call. You know, Krispy Kreme for the win. Now, I, w- I will say this too. Uh, do you ever get a, candidate, uh, a recruiter who actually follows up with you, but like months later? Yes. But but again, this goes back to the you you've had time to kind of fester in your head, and and you 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 have all of these scenarios that you've already run, and and you're already pissed off at the fact that they've ghosted you for that yes. long. So basically, when I get that call. I'm already in a sour headspace to that company. They've 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 done a bad job of of making themselves look good. Girl, so, they hurt me, man. They hurt they, me. They hurt me deep, very deep. Now, now again, a good recruiter will let you know that things are things are not happening, but they're still interested. But they're looking yeah. at they're they're still they're still interviewing. That's yeah. what a good recruiter will do, even though that gives you not much to to chew on there. 
that's what a good recruiter will do right. instead of them all of a sudden maybe and, and now let me tell you what's happening on their end basically the hiring manager said okay well this candidate's good but i want to see a few more and yeah. so a good recruiter will not let that happen a yeah. good recruiter will have set up like i said before the a players the b players the c players and established we will hire any of these if these conditions occur yeah but a bad recruiter will just say listen to the hiring manager and say okay well we can interview more even though they have some people in hand yeah and so a good recruiter will push back on their hiring manager and do that and that's why you get these situations where you don't hear from anybody that's because after like three four months of this role being open eventually the team the hiring team is getting antsy and they're like we got to get somebody in here now okay right we'll find that guy that you were talking to and then of course they reach out to you and you're like i, I took a role like two months ago i know no. That ship sailed. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's what's happening on the other end. Well, it's good to know, and and I've had that experience. Like I'd mentioned back in 2016, I joined a company called Citrix. Um, that was probably my best role. I really enjoyed working for them, and 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 I, I was frustrated by the interview process. I think I had 15 interviews over the course of three months, but it was an external recruiter first who was mm. amazing. She was she was so good and she was so on top of things. Every week I'd get a call and they'd say she'd say I know that nothing's happening. There's, uh, you know, there are a lot of candidates they're going through. They're talking with people, but they really liked you. Um, I just want to keep you, you know, abreast of what's happening. And she did that for three months, and and I was I was frustrated, but at the same time I was hopeful because basically. Okay, so she's just letting me know that this is the sentiment with in in the house, and eventually I got that role. But but what really happened was, they are a company that is very very attentive to the personalities that are coming in to to augment mm -hmm. that culture, and and very very rarely did I ever see them make a choice that wasn't right, and and so. You know, while Citrix is no longer its own entity, it's it's now Cloud Software Group. They maintain some of the best recruiting and and staffing processes and approaches that I've ever seen in a company. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. Good. Totally. So let's see. I mean, what haven't we talked about? I mean, we we've kind of already talked about the what to do if you're ghosted and and what your reactions are. But I think the final question, the final piece of this puzzle is as a candidate, when do you move on? I'm I'm out. Out, uh, done, mics dropped. Yeah. So I will say this. I just said on this call, all these things are happening on the behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Because of that's happening. And again, it's no fault of the recruiter necessarily. Maybe the way they're executing it could yep. be their fault. But if the recruiter is getting back to you and they just don't have anything, yep. I would say don't move on unless like the role itself or the company culture, the people you talk to are just not for you. Right. Then move on. But if it's just a matter of like, hey, these people are just taking a long time, there could be a reason for that. And it could not necessarily be the recruiter's fault. Right. So I would say don't move on unless you just absolutely just will not work at that company. Right. And also don't put all your eggs in one basket. Like when you're interviewing, you have multiple irons in the fire, just right at all times. You want to hedge your bets and keep things going. You have the power as the candidate. Like you don't have to like apply for one company and talk to one recruiter and one hiring manager and then just like wait for them yep. to tell you something, right? Because you're not doing yourself any favors. You want to do that multiple times, right? At all Absolutely. times. Absolutely. But the problem is, I mean, a lot of candidates get that one track mind and they have a myopic view of, yeah, okay, no, this is the opportunity I want, you know, regardless of how many tens or hundreds of other people might be interested in that. And and I, I actually sort of fell victim to that as, you know, my last offer, that verbal offer I was telling you about, I stopped looking for three weeks. It, it uh, was about three weeks before I got the call saying, oh, we're going to rescind this offer because blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, uh-oh. And I, I found myself in a situation where I'm starting from scratch again, and, and I'm already right. four months into unemployment, and I'm, I'm starting to panic going, okay, so I don't have anything in the fire right now. Good. Right. Yeah, so have multiple things going on. That that's really the the rule of thumb. And we can talk and next, I think in one of our next podcasts, we're gonna talk about how to strategically job search. Yes. But it's just it's a good idea just to 
not hedge your bets just on one on one thing. That's just never a, a good idea. <laughs> Point well taken and uh, <laughs> learned by experience, Mark. Now, I, I, we're we're about at the end here, but there's one thing I wanted to add as kind of an appendix item to the why won't they call me back? And we didn't mention it just out of respect for candidates, but you could really be a bad candidate for that role. So maybe they just don't see you as a viable fit. Um, then they, they then so a good recruiter will reject when it's time to reject. Yes. And I've had that, and it seems like they take a little bit of pleasure in that sometimes, but it's okay. <laughs> At least you know. And, and I'm not saying that people are bad people. They're just not the right candidate for a given role. So that could be a reason why they aren't calling you back. And, and I will say this. If the rejection – so there's different rejection levels. There's a rejection just from the recruiter after you talk to them. Yeah. And there's a rejection maybe from the hiring manager – uh, from uh, after that you talk to the hiring manager, right. those ones are probably going to come at you from like an ATS generated kind of rejection letter. Yeah. And it's not because they're the recruiter is being lazy or they want to make it as impersonal as possible. It's yeah. because there are some like actual legal things in there that they can't do. Like they can't actually say exactly why right. you were rejected. Like they can't say that they, they can get in trouble if they say something like you didn't have enough, you weren't, you, you didn't have enough experience in this particular thing because if they say that yeah. you can just turn around and then get into a, an argument with them and the company as to why you do. Right. So that's why they send the rejection letter of like other candidates were better suited and, yeah. you know, we'll look to connect again in the future for different roles. That's right. the one they're going to get. Now, if you do an onsite, then it's expected that the recruiter either a calls you or writes a pretty nice personalized rejection letters to why you're not going to get a, a be a fit for the company right we're sorry but the stench you brought into the uh, boardroom is still it was too, it was too great out. it was too great to bear yeah and we don't think we can do that every week because the overhead costs for that would be just ugh, insurmountable yeah. yes a so, lot of fa- a lot of fans a lot of open windows a lot of air freshener <laughs> right <laughs> so That basically brings us to the end of this episode of the Recruiter of Oz podcast. Mark, once again, thanks for uh, joining and offering your insights. Hopefully these are useful for you. And uh, the next episode, I believe, is going to focus more on that initial screening and, and, and what to do, what not to do. So stay tuned. And in the meantime, if you have any questions or would like to submit a topic, you can always go ahead and reach out to uh, Mark or myself on LinkedIn. Or yes. you can reach out to me directly through email at scott at arphilic.com, which is scott at A-R-P-H-I-L-I-C dot com. Until next time, have a great day and uh, good luck on your job search. See you guys.